Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm Tony Perez of Opticus Design, and I'm part of the team on the Santa Rosa project, and we're here in these six sessions to talk to you about form-based codes. And the first one today is about what is a form-based code and how does it work? So thanks for joining us, and I look forward to your questions. So thanks for joining us. Uh, in talking about what a form-based code is and is not, it's first important to understand why a form-based code came to be. Form-based codes came to be generally because use-based codes or conventional zoning, as you might know it, uh, they, were, they, were, they are tools that were designed to prevent bad things from happening, uh, which is a great and noble concept, right? But they were never intended to make anything. They're always um, devised as a uh, protection tool or a preventative tool, not a generative tool. And that's really important understanding uh, why form-based codes to, came to be. And so, um, so the conventional zoning approach basically doesn't know what it wants. It highly regulates physical environments, yet it produces results like this on the left. The conventional zoning approach that is in your community did not produce the result on the right. That was produced prior to conventional zoning coming into cities, uh, largely. There are exceptions, but largely the, the result on the right was before. And so it's really important to understand that form-based codes came about because of these kinds of results. And we're not talking about architecturally. We're talking about size, scale, adjacencies, you know, is it, a, is, it, is it a good physical neighbor or not? In this case, uh, the example on the left is not. And in addition to those types of examples, the conventional zoning approach focuses on numerical uh, parameters and, and measurements that really have little to do with how you experience a building. In this case, the building on the right is three stories with 49 units in it and is longer than you can see in the photograph. And the build, yet it is the same density as the building on the left that is only five units and two stories. They're nearly the same density you can see there, 29 versus 30. And so zoning code would focus on that number and those other characteristics, if they were regulated, they would be down the list, but most conventional zoning codes, they are not. So it's really important to understand the form-based approach by understanding that you know, at the end of the day, there are two categories of buildings. Um, you could say, well, Tony, you know, I, I, I've observed 35 different types of buildings, and that's true. But I learned this from an architect named Stephanos Paulzoidos that I worked for about 20 years ago. And he taught me this, that there are two categories of buildings you can see on the screen. They all sort into one of these two categories. Buildings that are individually or collectively as large as most or all of a block, block scale, or buildings that are the size of detached houses, which with front, side, and rear yards. And from the smallest cottage in your house to the biggest mansion in your house, and that would be house scale. Understanding this really helps you understand where Missing Middle, for example, fits into the overall spectrum of buildings. From the most rural and the, and the largest property with the, with the largest house out in the country to the largest tower you can think of in a downtown. That's the spectrum and missing middle falls in the middle. And this is a really useful context to understand that, hey, we're talking about primarily house scale buildings with a couple of exceptions of the, of the block scale at the smaller end of that spectrum. So form-based planning and zoning, uh, you know, as you can see, there's a real emphasis on the physical realities, physical intentions of a community. But there's also an intention about mixing uses, mixing housing types, and and equally important is that building form, as you've heard me say in these few slides, it's as important or more important than land use. And the conventional zoning approach says it's all about land use and all these other characteristics, we'll, we'll deal with them as we need to. And you can see what kind of results that produces. The form-based approach also says the public realm is huge. It's, it's, it's worth a lot of attention. In fact, that's how we experience buildings and neighborhoods. And so there's a greater attention uh, to that and the design role of buildings in the public realm. And then lastly, the, the standards are informed by what are the existing conditions? Where are the existing lot sizes? What's the intention for how to continue or change that character? And that leads into a big aspect of the form-based approach where 
uh, you know, you often see drawings like this and you say, well, that's an artist's rendition. You know, they, a lot of times they'll trivialize this kind of work with, with a sentence like that or, or statement. But this is more than a rendition. This is actually uh, looking at actual parcels in a community and saying, okay, besides our great ideas, like what fits on these parcels? What's economically viable? And how does that fit on the parcels? And how does the parking work? And what do the setbacks look like? And does that really fit the character of the neighborhood? Or do we need to adjust what we're thinking about? All that goes into what otherwise looks like somebody's um, own idea. And what you see on the screen there are ideas from a charrette more code is being prepared. So essential elements of a form-based code. The first item is a regulating plan, and this is basically a 3D zoning map. And if you can notice there, there are darker and lighter colors. Uh, the parcels in white, those are not in the form-based code that I'm showing you. But the parcels that have a dark gray or dark purple or light blue, those are all in the code. And the idea is to not only show, as a conventional uh, zoning map shows, the uh, the uses and height that are uh, allowed by the zoning district, but by the the intensity of the color, the darker meaning the the more intensely properties are used, the taller the buildings are, the um, more lot coverage there is, and the intense more intensity of uses. The lighter color is just the opposite. The setbacks are bigger, the lot coverage is is less, and the uses are less intense. And right away you can get an understanding from this diagram where the intensity is and is not. Secondly, the intent of a form-based zone is very different than a conventional zone in that it talks about what it intends to make. And if you look at a lot of your uh, existing intent statements, with the exception of the neighborhood mixed use zone, which starts to talk about these kinds of physical realities and characteristics and building types and walking distances uh, within uh, short walking distances of neighborhood uses, those kinds of things, most of the existing um, uh, intent statements are about density um, and uses irrespective of the kind of environments that they're trying to make. Um, and, you know, it's not a criticism that, that that can't make a good place. It just tends not to make a good place because it's silent on a lot of the important information that makes a good place. So building form standards, another essential element of form-based codes, uh, you know, what what lot sizes exist in the community and what can you do on those lot sizes? What kind of buildings fit on certain lot sizes versus other lot sizes? Uh, what are the setbacks that are making the environment that everybody wants right now or the environment that it doesn't yet exist that everybody wants? What are the building height measurements uh, that are making the physical character that people want either that exists or in the future? And then parking. In addition to requiring how much parking is required in certain areas, you, you need to really understand, well, where does the parking make sense so that it contributes to that physical character that we are taking so much time to, to work on and make sure that, it, that it, it delivers the kind of walkable places that we want. So getting the parking in the right location is key as well. And then there are supplemental standards to those essential elements I just mentioned. The first one is building types. You can actually define a, a more refined um, maximum zoning envelope by building type. So back here, you can say there's built the maximum zoning envelope that is generated by applying the, all these standards. And then you can refine it further and say, well, in certain areas, we want the multiplex small to be the biggest building that we want. And so here are the footprint uh, measurements and on-site open space measurements that need to be applied to this to generate that. Um, or frontage types. Uh, you can say, in addition to the other standards that are in the code, uh, we want to be clear about the types of elements that attach the building facade to the back of the sidewalk. And you can see here, if you look at the screen, uh, item G, uh, G is identifying the distance between the back of the sidewalk or the right of way and the building facade and all the elements in this particular case of the porch that are required to make that element again attached to the side of the back of the right of way and, and you know people talk about having an engaged um, or active public realm having really good frontage elements like porches which are just one of several choices of how to do this uh, this is a great way to activate an engaged public realm and then civic space types on properties of certain size 
uh, then it's going to make sense to require the applicant developer to um, provide some civic space like this uh, accessible to the public and definitely to the, to the tenants of, of, the, of the project. Other components that, that you could consider sometimes uh, in, in rare cases it makes sense to really uh, regulate architecture. We, we don't recommend that that be done most of the time for a lot of reasons. Um, but in some cases there's such a strong architectural character that you really want to make sure that the rest of the buildings and new buildings and additions and renovations uh, um, deliver more of that character. And so regulating that through standards uh, makes sense. And then sign standards to make sure that, again, if you have some strong sign character in an area that you generate standards to do that, uh, more of that. Uh, where these standards make sense uh, is what this slide is about. The form-based approach uh, works best in what we call the walkable urban. So in your case, it would, in Santa Rosa case, it would be in the downtown, downtown adjacent neighborhoods, the college area neighborhood. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum uh, is the suburban, all the outer neighborhoods. Um, in these areas, the, the form-based code doesn't make sense because as you've seen, the form-based code is trying, it's, it's made to uh, mix housing types, uh, provide uh, uh, um, uh, non-residential uses within walking distance of those housing types. And it, that's almost antithetical to what the suburban neighborhoods are meant to produce and how and what the expectations are in those areas. So we found it helpful to just continue with the conventional zoning approach in the suburban areas. But in, in between the, down, the downtown and downtown adjacent neighborhoods walkable areas, there's usually an area like this in communities, and, and there is one in Santa Rosa called transitional. And these transitional areas, uh, they are interesting because they lack the amenities to walk to, yet they have the short blocks and the walkable pattern, uh, and they just are missing those amenities. And so uh, it's, it's in these areas, the question is, do you want, do you, the community, want to keep the character as, as it is, or would you like to retrofit some areas over time to allow, allow those non-residential uses and amenities to, to be put into neighborhoods, and you could have that walkable environment as uh, some of the downtown adjacent neighborhoods in downtown. So the form-based code makes sense in the walkable and transitional. And then lastly, the repeating structure of communities is really what the form-based code is looking for. And I, I love this uh, analogy of the human face to make this point. All of us um, are uh, unique, thankfully, and we all look different. Even twins, if you look at them closely, they have differences that you can re re recognize after you talk to them for a little while. Uh, and, and if you're talking to twins, they'll tell you themselves. But no matter what, we all share the same anatomy. So you take that anatomy of the face and that repeating structure that we all share and take that thought and now we uh, apply that to communities. So here is my hometown of uh, 1200 people in Isles in California. It is tiny. And on the other end of the spectrum, here's a city of 120, 130,000 people in Pasadena, many, many times larger than that little town I grew up in, yet they share the same structure neighborhoods, corridors, and centers. My hometown has three neighborhoods, three centers, and one corridor, and they're tiny. <laughs> Pasadena has many more, and they are uh, all larger. There are none of them as small as where I grew up. But the point is that they all, they share all the same elements. It's the difference is they have more and, and, and more of them. And so you apply that to Santa Rosa and you say, well, here is the here is the aerial photograph of the city. Let's apply that concept to Santa Rosa, and you can see the main centers there: the downtown um, in the adjacent downtown area, and then the transit um, transit area. And then you can see the corridors in orange and the the yellow uh, neighborhoods there. Uh, and so, understanding that um, is key because now you can operate on this and say, are we working on a corridor and what kind of corridor are we work, working on? Are we working on a neighborhood? What kind of neighborhood? Are we working in the center? What kind of center? And, and so understanding where you are and what kind of element you're working on is very helpful. And the form-based code uh, provides that. 
Form-based code provides a direct connection between the neighborhoods, corridors, and centers, and all the elements inside each of those, um, each of those repeating elements in a community. And now you can start to operate on the individual pieces, the streets, the streetscapes, the buildings, civic spaces, facades, frontages, signage, uses, and, and so on. And in the, this approach, uh, and which I'm using the recording engineer's um, uh, sound deck here as, as an analogy, the approach is that uh, much like the recording engineer uses this tool to, to have a coordinated outcome of a sound by by manipulating the sound of individual elements, say say horns and, and percussion and voices and electric guitars or, or something else, they're coordinating it for one coordinated outcome. This is the, the form-based code does the same thing with all the elements that you choose. You choose as few or as many as you want. And you say, I'm gonna turn up the buildings, turn down the 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 um, the signage or turn up the uses and and uh, turn up the regulations on facades or whatever it is. Uh, turn up the streetscapes or turn them down. It's, it's a lower intensity area. Depending on the character, you can turn turn up or turn down what you're allowing and how you allow it in your town. And that's an overview of what a form-based code is and uh, how it works. And so really uh, look forward to your questions and discussion through this process. Thank you.